Welcome to NICU Essentials Lecture Series. Today, we will be talking about hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. We'll talk briefly about the incidence of HIE, as well as pathophysiology and diagnosis. We'll then go into the hypothermia protocol, including its physiology, monitoring, and post-warming imaging. We'll also touch briefly on adjunctive therapies and emerging therapies. HIE can occur in one to six per 1,000 live term births in developed countries. Oftentimes, abnormal findings on a neurologic exam in the first few days after birth is the single most useful predictor of a neurological insult. For mild encephalopathy, there is usually no increased risk of motor or cognitive deficits. However, for moderate to severe encephalopathy, there is almost always an increased risk of cerebral palsy, intellectual disability, motor cognitive deficits, and death. The following illustration models the pathophysiology by which hypoxic ischemic injury occurs. In brief, Decreased oxygen delivery, followed by reperfusion, leads to a cascade of events that ultimately results in cell death, excess inflammation, and oxidative stress. HIE can be divided into two phases. The first phase is characterized as primary energy failure. This phase is related to decreased cerebral blood flow, leading to decreased ATP and ultimately tissue acidosis. Subsequent intracellular derangements include loss of membrane channels and a release of excitatory neurotransmitters leading to oxidative stress and electrolyte disturbances, such as hypercalcemia. Increased calcium activates intracellular lipases and proteases, which further contributes to intracellular damage. Secondary energy failure is largely dependent on the extent of primary energy failure. This process occurs after a period of time after the initial event and is characterized by the chronic accumulation of excitatory neurotransmitters, continued oxidative injury, inflammatory changes, altered growth factors, and altered protein synthesis. The latent phase represents the interval of time between primary and secondary energy failure. This interval of time corresponds to a critical therapeutic window. Initiation of therapies during the latent phase has been shown to reduce the extent of brain damage. This therapeutic window lasts for approximately six hours, which suggests that therapy for HIE should be initiated within six hours of insult. The following table summarizes the characteristics of primary and secondary energy failure as discussed and the mechanisms of damage in HIE. Risk factors for HIE in a neonate include any event that is likely to compromise blood or oxygen supply to the fetus. These events include placental abruption, uterine rupture, amniotic fluid embolism, tight nuchal cord, cord prolapse or avulsion, maternal hemorrhage, trauma, cardiorespiratory arrest, severe fetal bradycardia, or prolonged labor. The criteria used to determine if moderate or severe encephalopathy has occurred are metabolic acidosis with a cord pH less than 7 or base deficit greater than 12, signs of encephalopathy assessed using Sarnat staging, which will be described shortly, multi-system organ dysfunction, and exclusion of other causes. Sarnat staging is used to evaluate neonates with suspected HIE. It assesses level of consciousness and mental status, muscular tone, 
reflexes, and autonomic function, and classifies HIE into three different stages, mild, moderate, or severe. The following table summarizes the SARNAT staging criteria. Note that in addition to mental status, reflexes, and autonomic function, pupil size, presence or absence of seizures, as well as EEG findings are used in the staging of HIE. The goal of therapeutic hypotherapia is aimed at blocking or dampening the cascade of events that is triggered by hypoxia and ischemia. Potential benefits of hypothermia include reduced cerebral metabolism, thus preventing cerebral edema, decreased energy utilization, inhibition of the inflammatory cascade, suppression of free radical activity, and inhibition of apoptosis. Thus, therapeutic hypothermia can be a useful tool in reducing the extent of brain injury. Multiple studies involving therapeutic hypothermia have shown a reduction in infarct size, decrease in neuronal cell loss, retention of sensory motor function, preservation of hippocampal structures, and recovery of EEG activity. In addition, the COOLCAP study found a decreased risk of death and major neurodevelopmental disabilities at 18 months of age in neonates with moderate to severe HIE. The neuroprotection offered by hypothermia is temperature specific. Progressively increased protection is associated with an increased depth of temperature. The cool cap trial showed that higher core temperatures was associated with an increased risk of death or disability, behavioral, and cognitive deficits. Therapeutic hypothermia uses a goal temperature range of 33 to 35 degrees Celsius. This range has been based on various clinical trials and is based on initiation of therapeutic hypothermia within six hours of the initial insult. Either whole body cooling or selective head cooling can be used. However, both have been shown to be equally effective and whole body is usually most cost effective and easiest to use. Supportive care during the hypothermic period is crucial for the neonate. From a respiratory standpoint, HIE infants often have a low CO2 due to the respiratory compensation from the initial metabolic acidosis. However, hypocapnia is harmful in HIE patients as it decreases cerebral perfusion and oxygen release from hemoglobin. Hyperoxia is also dangerous as it can increase oxidative stress and free radical production, particularly during the reperfusion phase. Thus, goal PaCO2s and PaO2s have been assigned to maintain normal oxygen and CO2 levels to prevent the secondary injury. Goal maps between 40 to 60 should be maintained during hypothermia to avoid hypotension and secondary ischemic injury. In addition, a history of hypovolemia may be present, such as in anemia or in the case of a placental abruption, and fluid repletion may be needed. If needed, epinephrine is the recommended presser of choice as dopamine can increase the SVR, thus worsening cerebral perfusion. It is important to have strict fluid control during the hypothermia period. Fluid overload should be avoided to decrease the risk of cerebral edema. In addition, strict monitoring and treatment of glucose levels should be performed. During HIE, anaerobic glycolysis depletes the hepatic glucose stores and glucose production becomes insufficient to meet the cerebral metabolic demands thus leading to hypoglycemia. Clinical correlation has been observed between low serum glucose concentrations and higher neonatal SARNOT stages. There has been no definitive recommendation on the most effective AED to use. Practitioners commonly use Keppra, 
Topamax, or Phenobarb. Amplitude Integrated EEG is a type of cerebral function monitoring that is often performed during the first few days after birth. The Amplitude Integrated EEG has been shown to predict neurodevelopmental outcomes in term infants who have HIE. Combined with the neurologic examination, the AEEG can predict persistent encephalopathy. It is important to note, however, that the amplitude integrated EEG should not be used as a tool for detection of seizures as it has not been proven to detect subclinical seizure activity reliably. Post-warming, a diffusion-weighted brain MRI is the most preferred imaging modality. It should be performed within the first week after birth, 24 to 48 hours after rewarming. The MRI often assists physicians with further management decisions in terms of prognosis or goals of care in those patients with severe HIE on ventilator support. MRI findings can also correlate with outcomes and can thus help predict the potential deficits or deficits the infant may have. For example, internal capsule and watershed injury are associated with motor deficits, while diffuse basal ganglia injury is associated with hearing and visual impairments. MR spectroscopy is also a useful modality that allows for the quantitative analysis of brain metabolites. The benefits of spectroscopy are that findings on a regular MRI can be normal for as long as 24 hours after the acute event, whereas MR spectroscopy can detect early changes. Specifically, an elevated ratio of lactate to N-acetyl aspartate in the basal ganglia may predict long-term neurologic impairments. Many new and emerging therapies for HIE are undergoing research currently. Xenon has been shown to inhibit excitatory amino acids and easily cross the blood-brain barrier. Adrethropoietin also shows some promise in neuroprotection against cell death as well as anti-inflammatory effects. Lastly, melatonin has been shown to decrease inflammatory cytokine levels and stimulate antioxidant enzymes in the body. And this concludes today's lecture series on hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Thank you.